Welcome to Christ Community Church. Great to see all of you this morning. We're wrapping up our series entitled Home. We've been talking about protecting our priorities, having great relationships, about marriage being a covenant partnership. And today I want to talk to you about love. Because there's hope for those who feel unloved. I've discovered that most people who feel unloved have a distorted view of reality. You see, they, they aren't really unloved. They just don't recognize the love that's in their life. And so their emotional pain blinds them to the fact that they have friends and family who love them very much. And so today I want to encourage you, if, if you sometimes feel unloved, or if maybe you're actually in a position where there, there seems as if there's no one that loves you, there's hope for you. Because there's hope for the hurting. God speaks to his people through the prophet Isaiah. He says, though, though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace removed. If you feel unloved, if you, if you feel estranged from the people that matter most, I want you to know there's someone who loves you very much. And he's gone to great lengths to prove it. The, the prophet Malachi spoke and he says, God said through him, he says, I, I have loved you. And to the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord said, I, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I, I have drawn you with loving kindness. And what I want to do today is to look at a story that's very painful and yet very beautiful all at the same time. We're going to look at a few excerpts from, from Hosea that describe the extent of God's love for you. You see, God doesn't just love you as, as part of a crowd. He loves you as an individual. He not only knows your name and your needs, but Matthew's gospel tells us even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. And so God's love toward you is, is personal. And he understands your hurts and fears. This morning we're going to look at a, an interesting couple named Hosea and Gomer. And we're going to see a marriage that had every reason to end in divorce. But we'll discover that God is going to call them to something entirely different. You see, there, there's no greater feeling than, than to be unconditionally loved. But, but love is, is so much more than a feeling. Love is a commitment to the well-being of another. And therefore, there's no greater emptiness any human can experience than to feel that no one loves them. And then to, to vainly search for love, thinking that, well, if, if I succeed, then enough people will love me. Or if I sleep with this person or that, then he or she will love me. But None, none of these strategies work. And they'll soon end up feeling alone and abandoned once again. Today's story illustrates God's great love for you and shows to what lengths he will go to keep loving you. It's a story about a man named Hosea. And it begins with God telling Hosea to marry an adulterous woman named Gomer. I don't know how she got that name, but, you know, it is what it is. This isn't Mayberry. Uh, every time I hear Gomer, that's what I always think about. But, uh, <laughs> you know, to, to give you a little bit of context, this, this, was, this was about 760 years before the birth of Christ. The, the northern kingdom Israel was enjoying a time of great prosperity. Unfortunately, whenever, whenever the economy flourishes, there's almost always a, a moral and spiritual decrease. And that's what was happening under the reign of King Jeroboam II. So, so God raised up a man, a prophet named Hosea, to speak to the people about their unfaithfulness and, and really what you could call their, their spiritual adultery. Hosea chapter 1 begins with, in a very unusual way as God began to speak to Hosea. And verse 2 tells us that God said to him, Go, take to yourself an adulterous wife 
and children of unfaithfulness. Because the land is guilty of the vilest adultery and departing from the Lord. So he, he married Gomer, daughter of Diblim. Now, the, the Hebrew word translated as adulterous wife could also be translated prostitute. And, and so what God was telling the prophet was to go and marry a, a very sinful woman, a woman who was, who was far from him. And in, in this vivid illustration, we see Hosea loving this immoral woman, just as God is loving the, na the immoral nation of Israel. And we see how our idolatry, how our rejection of the Lord feels to him. In this story, there are layers upon layers of meaning buried in this disturbing yet very beautiful marriage. This image, this illustration that God puts Hosea into, this, this place where he feels what God feels when he's loving us as we continue to sin and rebel against him. Hosea's marriage to Gomer really symbolizes God's love for you, a perpetual love, a, a covenant love that continues in spite of our rejection and our rebellious ways. And so number one, we see God's pain in rejection. We see God's pain in rejection. Hosea married Gomer, but very quickly something happened. she began to believe the most common misconception in our homes that there is. She bought into the lie that, that what she was missing, whatever it was that she was missing, was better than what she has. And she became discontent. Even though she knew Hosea was a, was a pretty good guy, you know, you know here's, here's this, this woman who's, who's, who's called a prostitute, and she's hooked up with the man of God. He goes out and he chooses her. She, she has to feel this uh, affinity for, for, for um, Hosea, appreciating all, all that he is, his faithfulness to her and his love. And Even though she felt all that, she felt like he wasn't giving her everything she wanted. Like she wasn't getting all she could get. And she, she determined that she, she didn't, what she didn't have was more important than what he was giving her. And so she began thinking about what she was missing, what she could have had, and she left Jose at home, and she returned to prostitution. She, she was unfaithful. She was adulterous, an adulterous woman. She, she was perfectly fitting the command that God had given to Jose, saying, go take yourself an adulterous wife, and the children of unfaithfulness. And so she does what people have done for centuries. She set aside her faithfulness for a feeling, what she didn't have for what she thought she could obtain, what she thought would bring fulfillment. That's what it tells us in verse 5 of Hosea chapter 2. She said, I will go after my lovers who give me my food and my water, my wool and my linen, and my oil and my drink. Now, we don't know exactly what happened in Gomer's situation, but in, in our culture, it could go like this. You know, the, there's this other woman at work who thinks I'm cool. You know, she, she doesn't tear me down all the time. She laughs at my jokes. She, she, says, says, she says she enjoys watching sports, and, and we have these things in common. And so... He or she is exciting, and so they trade what they have for, for the little that they're missing. And what always happens is they end up with less than they had in the first place. They believe the lie that what I'm missing is better than what I have, overlooking the fact that if they would invest in what they have, it would just be so much better. I mean, seriously, what, what, what could you have more in common than years of faithfulness to one another and children that you've had together? What more in common could you have than that? But it happens all the time. Years go by and we start believing the lie that what I'm missing is better than what I have. 
And so that's what happened to Gomer. She ended up with far less than she had in the first place. She went after her lovers, all the guys who listened to her, you know, guys that, that would compliment her, and they, they bought her these little gifts and told her she was special. So she went out. She conducted business with a couple of other guys. She got pregnant, and she had, had three kids. The first she had, at first she had a son with this other guy, and, and God actually told her husband, Hosea, to name this boy. In verse 4, she says, call him Yezreel, which means God will sow, scattered, because Israel would soon be scattered and in, in exile. She conceived again and gave birth to a daughter, and God once again told Hosea to name this daughter. And in verse 6, he said, call her Larachimah, a name which means not pitied or no mercy. And doesn't that really describe the, the hurt that God must have been feeling? Now, after she had weaned Larachima, Gomer went out with another guy and had another son. God told Hosea again in verse 9, he said, Call him Loami, which means not my people, no kin of mine, or not related to me. Doesn't that, don't you just feel the pain? You can, you, can, you can hear the hurt that God experiences when his people are rejecting him over and over and over again. And some of you, if you've ever been cheated on, if your significant other has ever been unfaithful, you know the pain. And God felt cheated on. His people were committing blatant spiritual adultery, and he, he becomes jealous. He's hurt, he's angry, and he's, he has every right to be because he's God. He created us to worship him, and yet he gives us free will because he, he doesn't want these little um, mindless robots worshiping him. He doesn't want that. He, he wants all, all of your heart, your, all of your soul, and all of your mind. That's what God wants. And so today I want to look at God's response to unfaithfulness. I want to take a little time because, quite honestly, our hearts easily become hardened. We, be, we become desensitized. And so we need to understand how our sin makes him feel. That's, that's, what, that's the purpose of this illustration that God was giving through Hosea and sending him to, to marry this woman, Gomer. And so number two, I want to take a look at God's heart and see how he responds to unfaithfulness. You know, one of the things about being a holy God is, is that you no longer have the luxury of, of turning your head and looking the other direction when a problem comes up. There, there was a time in Jesus' ministry when he found himself in, in a similar situation. It was a bad situation where others had been willing to ignore what was happening and just let, let things slide. But Jesus couldn't look the other direction. Instead, Jesus did something that no one expected. And as the saying goes, desperate times call for desperate measures. It happened that as, as Jesus was, was in Jerusalem for the Passover feast, that he visited the temple as was his custom and became angry because of the injustice that he saw. As worshipers entered the temple area, they were being taken advantage of by the money changers. Though the service they performed was a necessary service for travelers, they, they charged inflated exchange rates. And not only that, but there were also merchants there that were selling animals for sacrificial purposes at ridiculous prices. Worshippers were encouraged to, to buy these, these animals, to, to buy their sacrifice there in the temple, just, just to be sure that this animal I'm selling to you, this, this, is, this is a kosher animal. This, this, is, this is a good animal. You know, it's, it's acceptable. It's, it's lawful. And so Jesus recognized that it was all just a religious scam. And that they were taking advantage of sincere people. People who really didn't have you know, a whole lot of money, but they were charging them all these, all these 
um, fees and, and exorbitant prices just, just to worship, and, and it made him furious. He was furious. John chapter 2 tells us in verse 15 that he responded by making a, a whip out of cords and drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. Jesus was outraged by the injustice he saw, and his first response was a righteous anger. His, his actions were drastic, but, but they were very deliberate. He remained level-headed through the entire ordeal. He wasn't controlled by his emotions because there, there's such a thing as unrighteous anger. Anybody know what I mean? There's, there is an unrighteous anger, and then there's a, a righteous anger. Here we see that Jesus wasn't, wasn't thinking about himself. He was, he, was, he was thinking about his father. He was concerned, even consumed by the things of God. As a matter of fact, the scripture says, zeal for your house will consume me. And so Jesus chased the money lenders out of the temple, not because they were threatening to him, but because their motives were impure and they were offensive to a holy God. And it was just like Israel in Hosea's day. Almost 800 years before Jesus cleansed the temple, God speaks to the people of Israel, saying in Hosea chapter 2, he said, she has not acknowledged that I was the one who gave her the grain, the new wine and oil, who lavished on her the silver and gold. Therefore, I will take away my, my grain when it ripens and my new wine when it's ready. I will take back my wool and my linen intended to cover her nakedness. So now I will expose her lewdness before the eyes of her lovers. No one will take her out of my hands. And, and you, can, you can hear the pain in his words. You can, you can hear the hurt, can't you? And you can hear the jealousy. This is our God who says, I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. Therefore, you would have no idols, no other gods before me. And honestly, he has every right to demand your allegiance and your worship because he is your God. He's your Savior and your Redeemer. He's purchased you. But I want you to notice how he changes his tone and begins to apply the principles of, of what I would say in our, in our culture today, what would be tough love. Verse 13, he says, I will punish her for the days she burned incense to the bales. She decked herself with rings and jewelry and went after her lovers. But me, she forgot. And so God reprimands her with a little bit of, of fatherly discipline. There's a sternness in his voice. And yet it's almost as if you could, you could hear the tears as he says, you, you want your home and your children. You want to do your own thing. You want to put your idols there, your lovers before me. And you, you want to do life without my word and without my presence. Well, just go ahead. Go ahead, that's fine. See how you like it. And sadly, that's the way many people are living today. We've, we've been trained to do what we've done 5, 10, or 15 times before, which is just things get tough and we just pack up our toothbrush and move on. But I believe, like God, that, there's, there's a bit of, uh, that there really should be a bit of possessiveness in our homes, a little bit of, of righteous anger, because we're not going to give up that easy. So God responds to Israel with a righteous anger when suddenly there's a shift in his response. He's angry. His eyes are flashing when suddenly he's overcome with compassion. Suddenly he shifts his, the roles of that of a father scolding and, dis and disciplining a rebellious child to one of reconciliation. The third thing that we'll see is God's message of unfailing love. You know, it's kind of like in our homes when things don't go the way we want, when our, our spouse or our kids go and live outside of God's will, outside of our wishes, when, when they're prodigals. And many of you may have prodigals right now. You're, if you're in that season of, of hurt, of, of loneliness, emptiness, and pain, and yet, yet if, you, if you're in that place and you're hurting, 
here's something that just, just may bring a glimmer of hope to you. It's that God understands your pain. He understands your pain. There, there, there's no one who understands better what it's like to hurt as a husband and a parent than God. In Isaiah chapter 1, speaking of Israel, God said, I reared children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me. My people don't understand. Israel doesn't know. They don't understand. You see, God understands your pain. And now, now we see this shift in his tone in Hosea chapter 2. He says, therefore, I am now going to allure her. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her back her vineyards and, and will make the valley of Accor a door of hope. Now, now remember, to Israel, this is important to remember, that the valley of Accor was a place of trouble. That's, that's what a core means. It means trouble. Because that's the place where Achan stole from God and brought judgment and defeat to Israel's army. But that memory would soon be erased from their mind, and, and that valley would become a door of hope. The prophet Isaiah said, The Sharon will become a pasture for flocks, and the valley of a core a resting place for herds, for my people who seek me. today I'm believing that for those of us who've been walking through the valley of trouble, we'll find our, our way to the door of hope. Some, some of you in your homes are, are walking through the valley of betrayal. Like God, you know what it's like to walk through the valley of adultery or pornography or, or rejection, that, that valley of deceit. And yet when you walk through it together with God leading the way, you'll, you'll always come to the door of hope. You see, there are two ways to have a great home. It's two ways. The first way is to always do everything right and, and just never sin. I guarantee you it works every time. It's amazing because it really works. Just don't sin. The second way is to, is to walk through the valley of accord together with your spouse, with your children, and with your friends until you find the door of hope. And so what that means is that when you mess up, when you say mean and spiteful things, when you're, when you're hurtful, you turn to God, you repent, and you apologize. You ask him to conform your mind to the mind of Christ and your heart to the heart of Christ. You walk through the valley of accord because when you walk through it together, there is a door of hope. Some of you, hope is the last thing on your mind. You, you've given up on it. But I promise you, if you'll continue to pursue God in your home and you walk through the valley of Accor, God will, will make that valley a door of hope. And yet I understand that the, the challenge remains for those that, that don't have someone to walk with, you know, that, are, that are going through life by themselves, that are lonely. And maybe today you're walking through the valley of Accor alone. But what you do is you determine that you're going to walk with your hand out. To be ready to receive your spouse whenever they're ready to join you. But what you're not going to do is you're not going to let go of God. You're, you're never giving up. You're never letting go because there's always hope with God. Now watch closely as we fast forward because God's going to say the most amazing thing to Hosea. You, you know, here's, a, here's a man who's been nothing but faithful. Nothing but faithful, but time and time again, he's been betrayed by his wife. An undisclosed amount of time has passed, and, and Gomer has left Hosea. She's out prostituting herself, and, and God gives a very clear yet challenging message to the betrayed spouse. God tells Hosea in, in chapter 3, verse 1, Go, show your love to your wife again, though she is loved by another and is an adulteress. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. In other words, here's what he said. I want you to forgive and love as you've been forgiven and loved. Love her just as God is, is loving us right now, even though we, we don't deserve it. Love her just as God is loving us, even though we often find ourselves openly and consistently rejecting his goodness. 
God tells Hosea to love her the same way that he's loved and forgiven us. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods. God, through his living, powerful, active, and eternal word, is speaking into all of our lives today. He's speaking into our homes, into our relationships, and where we all live. There's there's no guarantee as to what Gomer's going to do. There's no guarantee. There's, There's no guarantee of her faithfulness. No guarantee of the outcome. But God is very clear on what we should do. And that is that we should love and forgive as we have been loved and forgiven. We're going to choose to do what's right. We're going to honor God and we're going to walk through the valley of Accor over and over and over again. Because on the other side, there's always been and there always will be a door of hope. God tells Hosea to go and to pursue his adulterous wife. To go show his love again. And so he finds her and he purchases her, out, purchases her out of prostitution. And it's such a beautiful story of redemption because he, he goes and he pays for his wife. She, she's she's on, the, on the auction block. She's being sold as a slavery to sin, in slavery to sin. And he pays for his wife. He buys her back, which is precisely what, what God did for us. That's what the Bible tells us, that, that while we were prostituting ourselves before, against God, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. He shed his blood to purchase us, to buy us back, so that we could truly know his love. Now, we don't, we don't know what happened to the marriage of Hosea and Gomer. We, we don't know how the story ended. But I imagine that once, once he bought her out of, out of slavery, out of, out of her sin, once he did that, how in the world could she ever walk away from him again? Could you imagine her gratitude, her love for him, have, having bought her off the auction block? How could she walk away from that? And yet when I look at what God did for us through Jesus Christ, I ask the same question. How could we not give ourselves to him? How could we walk away and rebel against him? How could we turn away from him? When you see and believe what he did, what other response could you have? Let's, let's, let's pray together and make application of, of this word. God, we do ask that you work in us. God, work in us in a way that only you can do. We acknowledge the layers of pain, all the different emotions that a message, that a word like this brings, all the, all the hurt and confusion. And I, I pray there would not be a sense of guilt, but that there was somehow, there would be a sense of hope. And as you're praying today, let me just ask really, in a, in a broad sense, in er, any area of your life, it could be relationally, it could be spiritually, it could be financially, it could be emotionally, it could be in any number of things, but how many of you would say right now, I feel like I'm in the, in the valley of a core? And anybody feel like, could you raise your hands if you feel like you're in, in the valley of a core? Anybody in that place of trouble right now? Just lift up, lift up your hands and respond to God. God, I, I pray. For those who are responding, those who have lifted their hands, I pray for those who, who are there in that valley of trouble. Or maybe those who would one day be there. God, I pray that your presence would be so real. Even as you promise us in, in, the, in Psalm 23 that, that we'll walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We'll, we'll fear no evil because you are with us. 
the valley of the shadow of death, the valley of Accor, the valley of depression, the valley of desperation, the valley of rejection, maybe the valley of a struggling marriage, the valley of a financial hardship, the valley of fear, the valley of self-doubts and guilt. God, we embrace you this morning. Teach us to put our faith in you and not in another person, not in our own ideas, not in our own ability to, to manipulate a situation or to, to, to try to get our desired outcome, but to put our faith in you. God, as you, as you may even lure us into the desert to speak tenderly to us, give us, give us the faith in the valley that no matter what we endure, that there's always a door of hope. And for those who've given up on their marriages, God, I pray for a door of hope, even acknowledging that as, as Hosea and Gomer, there, there, there's no guarantee. But give them a door of hope. Give us a door of hope. And as we keep praying, some of you, you know, you may be in that valley right now. Maybe it's a purposeful valley. And that's, that's what's so amazing about God. It's, it's really crazy that he, he would love you so much that he might have to take you out into the desert to get your attention. And he will because he'll, he'll lead you. He'll lead you into that desert where suddenly you'll, you'll have ears tuned to hear what he, can, what he says to you, where he can speak tenderly to you. And some of you right now, you're in that desert, you're in that valley. You don't know where else to turn. But the thing that's amazing is he's speaking to you. He's, he's alluring you. He's, he's reaching out to you. He's, 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 saying, he's saying, I love you so much. I'm willing to purchase you out of that. I'm, I'm will, I, I love you so much I sent my son. I sent Jesus for you. You can't get out yourself. You can't overcome your sin yourself. I sent Jesus to do for you what you could never do for yourself. I've loved you that much. I sent my son Jesus who shed his innocent blood for the forgiveness of your sin so that if you would believe and call upon his name that you'll be saved, you'll be forgiven, and you'll be changed. God would say to you today, I'm going to lead you through the valley into a door of hope. The door of hope is Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door through which all men would enter. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Perhaps you're in that valley today by a divine appointment because it's time for you to truly call upon Jesus. All of you who would say this morning, yes, I'm in that valley. I, I want that hope. Jesus, be my hope. Be my Savior and Lord. Would you lift your hands high right now? Just lift them up. Lift them up and let, let, me, let me see you and acknowledge you this morning. Just lift them high. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Call on his name. Call on the name of Jesus. All, all of us praying together, everybody out loud. Heavenly Father, I need forgiveness. I need hope. I need a Savior. Lord Jesus, forgive me. Change me. Make me new. Lead me through the valley to the door of hope. You are my hope. You are new life. I believe you died for me so I could live for you. I give you my life. I thank you for it. Now you have mine. In Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to transition into our, 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 the Lord's Supper now, so if we could have our musicians come up.